Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, on our monthly webinar, Shrinking the Change, an Innovative Team Steps Implementation Plan for Success and Sustainability. My name is Jen Braun, and I direct the AHA Team Training Program here at the American Hospital Association. Um, just a few rules of engagement today before we get started on our Zoom platform. Uh, we should all be hopefully pretty familiar <laughs> fortunately or unfortunately by now, but audio for this webinar can be accessed in one of two ways. You can either listen to the audio through your computer or you can dial in by phone. Um, if you toggle to the bottom of your toolbar, uh, you should be able to switch between one or the other, but please know that you're in a listen only mode. Um, Q&A today will be held at the end. Uh, so we encourage you to submit any questions for our speaker, Stacy today. Uh, I'll save them for the end and we'll do a moderated Q&A. But if you have any logistical questions, um, please chat them in, we'll respond in real time or just certainly any comments that you have. Um, our chat is typically pretty active throughout this webinar. Um, a few other notes here. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available uh, on our website after uh, today's webinar. Uh, and you please note that the chat will not be included in the recording. Um, and then just a note too that you can chat everyone uh, where it says that two box, or you can chat um, just to speakers and panelists. Oopsies. Let me go back there. Um, we are happy to offer continuing education for today's uh, webinar free of charge. Um, if you uh, are new to us, you have to create a Duke OneLink account. This is a one-time only setup. Um, and my uh, colleague, Kara, will chat in those instructions uh, uh, throughout the webinar. Uh, but you should also be able to refer to it in your confirmation email. Uh, but essentially, at the end of today's webinar, what you're going to need to do is text that code J-A-D-B-U-S to the number you see there after the webinar is over. Don't worry, we will show this, uh, this uh, code and phone number again at the end of today's webinar. Um, a few upcoming events. Uh, we're really excited to have our in-person TeamSeps Master Training courses back in action. Uh, so we hope that uh, if you're interested, especially this is a great uh, tee up with Stacy's presentation. If you're new to Team Steps and you want to become a master trainer, we have in-person courses at several sites across the country uh, through the remainder of the year. We also have virtual options as well, and we will continue offering those. Um, I want to call out: we have a four-week uh, virtual workshop on managing conflict in healthcare uh, that begins in September. Uh, we also uh, will continue to offer our virtual master training course. And then finally, we have uh, what we're calling our Team Steps for Change Leaders and Champions. This is a really great course for those who have been exposed or had previous Team Steps training that either need a refresher and need maybe a little additional help with implementation and sustainment. Uh, so registration is currently underway for everything. Team rates are available if you have teams, which we highly encourage. Uh, so you can click on the, on the hyperlinks. They should be live. Kara can also check chat them in. Um, and then finally, we have next month, our monthly webinar on August 10th on healthy aging, creating age-friendly health systems. So feel free to join us for that. Um, finally, AHA team training offers custom on-site training. So if you're a hospital or organization looking to train a larger volume of staff, we can come to you in person or create a custom virtual uh, course. We also can provide long-term um, engagements to help build capacity within your organization. And therefore we continue to help implement and um, you sustain that. Um, so if you're interested, feel free to fill out our custom training request form and a team member will be in touch to provide more information there. Um, so that's enough of me. Um, I'm really excited uh, for you all to uh, uh, get to meet and hear from our, our speaker, Stacy. Um, I met Stacy this past March at a conference. She's phenomenal. She's worked with some of our faculty that have been involved in Team Steps for a number of years. So I'm going to let Stacy say a little bit more about herself and let her take this over. So Stacy, all you. 
Thank you, Jen. And yeah, some great opportunities coming up from AHA, and it's good to see that we're back in person. Very exciting stuff. So um, I am Stacey D. Moranville. I am currently the Pierce Region Nursing Director for Family and Midwifery Birthing Centers um, at St. Joseph's Medical Center in St. Elizabeth's Hospital in the Tacoma area of Washington. And that's um, part of our Virginia Mason Franciscan Health Team. Um, but the work that I'm going to be talking about here actually occurred um, at a hospital that I um, was privileged to be part of. So I'll talk a little bit more about them in just a minute. So today's objectives real quick, we're going to start um, with identifying innovative and interactive training models um, for an interprofessional team. We're going to discuss at quite a bit um, about how to use that 30, 60, 90 day plan to develop an effective way to address resistance and create an alignment when you're implementing team steps. And then focus a little on frontline ownership and how integral it is to su the success of your team steps um, implementation plan. So I want to start with um, kind of get to know you guys a little bit. So we're going to go with a poll here and I want to learn just a little bit about what is your experience with team steps. Are you a first time learner haven't heard anything really excited to be here and get some info some basic knowledge of what team steps is but definitely are looking to learn more. Um, maybe you've attended some team steps training already, or you've already implemented or are in the process of implementing and hoping for some just new wins out there. So if we could go ahead and get you guys to respond and we'll see what we've got. Great, great. A little bit of everything is looking like here. Just a couple more seconds for people to respond if you want. Well, the good news is regardless of what your knowledge level is and what you've um, experienced with Team Steps, we're gonna cover um, a variety of topics that should be able to add to your current knowledge or it reinvigorate your passion for Team Steps. Um, and then I wanna go on to one more poll to find out if you're ready to implement or will be implementing here in the future, what would your role be in Team Steps? Are you going to consider yourself an executive sponsor or senior leadership, um, ensuring that all the resources are there? Are you more on a project manager or project leader um, point person where you're going to be ensuring that everything is handled on the step by steps? Uh, maybe you'll be part of a change team. That's the boots on the ground, the planning, the implementing, the teaching portion. Or are you a frontline champion? You love this work and you wanna just really keep it going on a day-to-day -day basis. All right, let's see how we're doing here with participation. There we go. So a lot of us are ready to be part of a change team, um, which is great. I really am gonna focus quite a bit on that portion. Um, and then project manager, that's what I was um, in our implementation at Valley. And so we will touch on what does it look like when you're the executive sponsor or frontline champion, but I think you guys are all in the right spot. So um, let's dive into a little bit more about us. So this was done um, at the University of Washington Valley Medical Center, which is in Renton, Washington. Um, it's a public district hospital and it's affiliated with the University of Washington. And our vision is to be a high reliability organization driven by the power of our talented, engaged and diverse workforce. And Team Steps aligns 100% with what high reliability is. It's really in that building block foundation of it. Um, we are a high risk delivery facility doing about 3000 births in 21. We have a level three NICU um, that's supported by the amazing team at Seattle Children's Hospital. Um, and we also have an inpatient pediatric program there. Um, we have a variety of practitioners. Here's a couple, um, our medical director and some frontline OBGYN providers who are also part of our change team. Um, we have midwifery, family practice supporting a residency, and anesthesia. So a wide variety of mix of practitioners that we needed to include in our plans. 
Um, and then Integral was this amazing leadership team of nurses. Uh, these are the managers and assistant nurse managers for family birth pediatrics and NICU. And they were also part of that change team, helping to engage and teach and support and champion. Um, and that is Noelle in the middle. She is our mascot through COVID um, and was a great part of our fun that we would add to our day. Um, they support about 200 staff members through this process, everything from a frontline secretary to our lactation consultants, our RNs, LPNs, um, so just a variety of team members. And then, of course, we got to utilize the expertise of Ross Ehrmantraut, and he's been part of the AHA and is definitely who we consider to be a guru um, for Team Steps. And he really walked us through every phase of this um, and helped support as we developed and implemented that change team. So why Team Steps? Why should you do this? What are the benefits? What are we going to get out of it? Um, when I started at Valley um, in the summer of 2017, I was able to quickly identify that we had really high performing individuals. Um, but that teamwork and creating that high performing team was pretty inconsistent, especially if we had to cross departments or um, had a mix of roles in a situation. And I had just recently completed my master trainer program in uh, early 2000. 2017 with Ross and realized that we, we needed team steps and we were ready for it. Um, and this was something that we really wanted to develop that situational monitoring and creating mutual support, improving our communication and really getting staff ownership into this process. Um, and so we presented that to our senior leadership team and it fit right in with that high reliability journey that we were going on. And so we were able to become the pilot division um, for this team steps program. And so we went straight into action and created our next steps. So for those that are really new to Team Steps, we'll start with what is this program that we're talking about. And Team Steps stands for Team Strategies and Tools to Enhance Performance and Patient Safety. Very long name, which is why we've always called it Team Steps. Um, but it was developed by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality and in conjunction with the Department of Defense in the mid 2000s. Um, it really does focus on improving your collaboration and communication within a team, which if you're ever looking at a root cause analysis or an intensive review, communication and a breakdown in it is often one of your key components um, that you want to try to address. Um, and it's really a key driver for patient safety because we're keeping our patient, our family, and our care team at the center of what we're doing while ensuring that we have these four components of mutual support, communication, situational monitoring, and leading teams um, through the tools that we teach too. And there is the link there uh, to the AHA website that can walk you through all the steps. It's got all of the resources and just everything that you would need to start utilizing uh, team steps in your organization. So we chose to break down our tools into these three sections, a 100, 200, and 300 level, just like we were back in college. Um, and if you're on the AHA website, you may see slight variations in naming conventions or how the tools are broken down, but the concepts are very, very similar to what we were using. And they weren't new to the team at Valley. Um, we were definitely doing debriefs when there was a poor outcome or a really complicated situation. Um, the NICU was really great about doing um, a huddle before a high-risk admission, but they weren't always great about including the OB team in that huddle. Um, so we had a great foundation, but we definitely were lacking standardization and consistency in using these tools. Um, and so when we decided to move forward, we wanted to make sure that we had the right setup for how to implement these tools. So we started with our multidisciplinary change team. And knowing that we had a very wide diversity in our care team, we needed to make sure we had that same diversity in our change team. And we needed representation from all of our areas and all of the disciplines. Um, and that was something we found to be very valuable, that you would have a team member that you worked with or was part of your um, group that was up there sharing their knowledge and supporting this work and then being a frontline leader. And as part of the change team, you need to be committed to the planning and implementation, which was initially a little bit of a, a challenge, especially when we're trying to get providers who are also providing time in clinics. Um, but they were successful in attending our biweekly meetings for planning and implementation. And once we had that portion, then, then we were able to shift to monthly follow up for sustaining and follow through. Um, everyone on the change team became a master trainer. 
and participated in this staff training sessions that we'll um, dive into more. And then they were also the super users for those tools when they were out um, at the bedside. As you know, a, a leader, it's easy for me to talk about team steps and to role model those skills, but I'm not on the unit every day. And members of our change team were, and it was phenomenal to see them just take that and run with it. And then we made sure that we were utilizing this 30, 60, 90 day plan, because really when you think about team steps, it's a massive project. Um, and the concepts and the steps can just be really overwhelming. And so we broke it down into 30, 60, 90 day plans in order to track our progress and to quickly identify if we needed additional support and who was responsible for each of those items. So that's why you guys are here. Let's talk about how to shrink this change and what does that 30, 60, 90 day plan look like? So this is a quick example of one that has been completed and I have a blank one following, but it's really a way to break it down into simple steps and then to take those blocks of 30 days and continue to break them down into action items. Um, and for me as the, the project leader, it helped me to ensure that I had accountability. I knew who to follow up with. Uh, team members could access this at any time to check in on what they were responsible for. Um, and I'm very visual, so I also use the color coding. And this is one that's been completed, so we see everything that's in green. But as we were working through each one of our meetings, um, if we were stuck on something, it was red and we needed help and we wanted to talk about that as a team. If it was work in progress and we just needed an update, we had color coded it orange. But for this one, hey, it's easy to see. Everything's green, we're good to go. And those were um, reviewed as our monthly meetings and updates. So here's one of the blank tools and let's walk through each one of those sections. So specifically, we're gonna start with what is the problem or challenge that we are trying to identify and improve with team steps. And for us, that was we lacked consistency and communication across our division and really wanted to say, how can we communicate better and get to that high functioning team instead of just highly functioning individuals? And the next step is to create your destination postcard. What does that look like when you are done? And what are you going to do to get to that um, goal of improving communication? And we started with, we need to implement these 100 level tools and create a foundation for our teams. Um, and then the next step is to say, okay, if we're going to implement 100 level tools, what can we do in the first 30 days? And that was to create that change team and establish our meetings and get everybody um, aligned with the vision and answer questions and kind of develop our initial plan. And then we said in the next 30 days, what are we going to work on? And we had um, our TPQ survey, which we'll explain here in a little bit. We wanted to get that launched and get some baseline data to be able to drive our actions. And then our last 90 days was um, planning and teaching the actual classes to over 300 members of our division. Um, and when you start to break it down into steps one, two, and three, you can continue as many steps as you need. Um, and sometimes those steps carry forward um, and you'll use them in the next 30 day plan and the next 30 day plan because it's ongoing. It's continuing the education. It's checking back in. Um, but it really is shrinking that change into manageable steps and um, dividing the work out because not one person can own this in order for it to be successful. And the other benefit of using this tool is um, as you complete your project and you go back to look and see what did we do well, what were our accomplishments, it's an easy tool for you to share with your senior leadership team, to share with that C-suite, and when you're ready to publish, here's your data points that you can talk about when you're ready to share with the um, others in your organization or even bigger. So like I said, we started with the TPQ survey. Um, this is a validated tool from AHRQ. Um, the link is there that you can access it um, from their website. And here's a snapshot of one of the sections on communication. And the answers go from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And we set this up in an online format um, so we could allow staff members to easily access it. And we can monitor response rates and give prompts out if we needed. Um, and the one thing that we found to be really successful is that it wasn't just going to come from me as the sponsor of the project or even from um, our C-suite. It was coming from the direct manager or OB chief or group leader. It's a lot easier to um, ignore an email from somebody that maybe you don't really know or, oh, that's just, you know, corporate email. So we found it was 
most successful when it was coming from a direct leader. And we were able to get um, a 36% response rate from our team. And we had excellent representation from all areas of the survey. Um, and so I wanna share some of our initial baseline data that we use to drive our actions. So these are busy slides, I understand that, and there's lots of numbers in there, but I really want us to start in thinking about the color variation, because um, what we'll compare to our after results and, and you'll see where we've shifted the bars. Um, so greens are good. These are strongly agree and agree. Um, yellows are, uh, I'm not so sure about what's going on, indifferent, maybe, I don't know. And reds are disagree and strongly disagree. Um, and then looking at the questions, you know, we had some success already in team members looking for information, but they identified that we definitely need to work on how do we communicate clearly and receive feedback? How do we include um, our patients in our care team conversations? And are we ensuring that they understand the communication that we're given to them? When we focused on situational monitoring, um, some of these questions are things that we want it to be an always. These are 100% need to be agree and strongly disagree because they are co core components of patient safety. So speaking up when there's a mistake that's occurring in a procedure or a process, we want that to be 100% all the time. I feel safe doing that. I know if it was my um, sister having a procedure in our division, I would want it to be 100% always. So it really called out that even though none of these looked, um, you know, astronomically concerning, we wanted them to be even better than what they were. And finally, looking at mutual support, um, we are a busy department and high volumes and high acuity. And that means that mutual support is even more critical to create that high performing team. And mutual support is looking at conflict. And can you raise that safety question and concern in the moment to reduce that patient harm? And we found that we really need to um, look at some improvements in that area, especially. So we went back and took that data and put it into a 30, 60, 90 day plan. We focused on 100 and 200 level steps. We decided after getting these results that we could definitely look at both levels. Um, Ross was amazing at teaching our change team. He sat us and walked us through each slide. How do we become master trainers? How do we share this with our team? And then we went ahead and scheduled our classes. Because of the size of the group that we were trying to address, we needed about 10 classes. Um, with the Lego exercises that we're going to utilize to um, drive home and solidify those skills, you need at least 12 people in a class and a any more than 25, and it gets to be too large. So we definitely needed to monitor our space. Um, we made sure we had dyad teaching partners. So it wasn't nurse to nurse if we could. We wanted that nurse doctor, um, nursing director to frontline staff member, really creating that um, alignment. And one of the team steps keys is saying, Everybody in the room has a voice, regardless of what your title is. And so we wanted to role model that from the beginning. Um, and we made sure when people participated that you didn't just get to sit at your table with the team from the NICU, um, that you had to have a little mixing things up and ensuring that there was representation from as many um, departments and roles as we could, because that's another thing in the team building that we found was critical. So we always said, it's gonna be a great class because you get to come play with Legos. And they truly believe that and um, came with open arms and excited brains. And so we set each one up to be a two hour session, but most of them ended up being about just 90 minutes. Um, our agenda said, let's you know start with what is team steps and walk through each of these core tools. Um, we integrated three different team tower exercises with the Legos where they were utilizing some of the skills that they didn't know that they were learning, but they really were. Um, and learned each time. And then we also talked about our results, where we started, where we wanted to go, and how we were going to implement that plan. Um, and we had really, really great success with this. 94% of the inpatient uh, women and children staff attended. 88% of our physician um, partners were able to attend, which is huge. Um, especially as we were getting ready to um, go into a holiday season. It was just great to see their engagement and excitement. Um, and so I want to show you guys what it looks like to be at one of these Lego exercises. Um, and it's a quick video, just a little clip, but notice 
how um, focused they are on this. And this became very, very competitive, um, which is fun to see. Um, and they were excited to, to put their training. And every time we started a new exercise, they were ready to do better than they did the last time. So it's just a quick snap of what does it look like to be um, participating in the Legos. So I um, want to take a little break from just me talking, and I want us to um, hear from Stacy Miller. She is a charge nurse and a very engaged member of the um, labor and delivery team at Valley. And she was one of the first people that jumped all in and has continued to lead the charge to sustain this work. So I had the opportunity to spend some time talking with her. So let's hear from Stacy. So let's take a minute and uh, connect with one of the members of our uh, change team. So I'd like to introduce you to Stacy Miller. Uh, she is one of our amazing frontline charge nurses and really just stepped into this role of initiating team steps. And so I just wanted to have a conversation with you, Stacy, about what it was like um, as a nurse and as somebody who was like really an early adopter in this um, crazy journey that I asked everybody to go along me with me on. Um, what about team steps really just sparked that kind of energy? Um, and what did you hope to gain from some of these tools? Oh man, I was bought in from like the first hour of master training. Um, on my unit, I'm a big believer in communication and collaboration. So team steps was like this big shiny diamond for me of like, oh, um, so I was bought in right away. Um, I loved that the team in when we were in master training, I love that the team consisted of everybody. It was um, doctors and nurses and directors and managers. And so that just really showed me um, in my training that if everybody is bought into this, then this is something that's really going to work. Um, so I was excited to really to bring it back to our unit. Um, I, you know, historically, we kind of see these cultures um, between staff and doctors, right? But what this training showed me was that we can break down those barriers to make sure that our patients get the safest care. And if we all receive the same training, um, then it's going to create this culture change. And that's really what we've seen. Awesome. Awesome. Do you have a really great memory from the, the pre-planning part and the implementation? Is there something that really stood out for you on that side? Um, my, the memories, um, well, there's a couple, um, I think the, the doing the master training was super fun. Um, Ross and his team, they were amazing. Um, we got to create in, even in the master training level, we got to create these teams, which included the doctors and directors and managers that we talked about. Um, and we did some team building within that training, right? So we would, um, this our relationships and the dynamics started shifting right then and there within um, that master training. Um, I always joke about, um, at the end of our master training when Ross, you know, asked like, oh, how does everyone feel that went? And I raised my hand and I said, if I have 80% battery left on my cell phone at the end of a training class, I know this was a great training class. So that was one of my favorite memories. Um, the second one, I think, was the first time we all had gone through training. We all knew what we need, the tools we had. And we had our big first, our first big emergency after that training. And it was from start to end. We did a brief, we had huddles, we used closed close loop communication. Afterwards, we did a debrief. And then we sat there and we were like, oh my gosh, this works. I mean, it was a moment of this is real. <laughs> and that just makes my heart so happy to hear that because as a director and as somebody who was spearheading this, I wasn't able to see those uh, moments where it all just went the way it was supposed to. And mm -hmm. people could say, oh, it's not a flavor of the month. 
No. This is something that additional work I have to do in my job. This is actually going to benefit me and my patients right? and making my team better. So thank you for sharing that. Oh, that's so amazing. Um, now it's obviously not all roses and sunshine. Um, so where did we kind of struggle on the way and what did we learn from that? Um, I think that, um, some struggles were, um, you know, there's always going to be that little group of people that aren't bought in. Right. So I think the struggle was pulling them along like, nope, come on, this is what we're doing. Um, and that wasn't, you know, I think maybe traditionally people are thinking that it's maybe those are more of the physicians, but no, it was across the board. Um, even people outside of our walls, pulling them along to say, no, there is so much value in this and how, how can we not implement this mm -hmm. tool? So that was a struggle, but eventually, um, because the culture was moving along without them and changing without them, it became like, we, I don't really have a choice. I got, I got to jump in on this. Um, cause they're moving around me. <laughs> they're moving around me. They're chugging along without me. So, um, I think that was a little bit of a hiccup and then, um, COVID kind of, uh, threw a wrench in it a little bit, um, with training. Um, but we were able to, um, because so many of us, um, were trained or master trained to teach doctors and nurses and managers, there was the buy-in from the beginning. And so everyone wanted to keep the momentum moving forward. Um, they see the value, they see the, the, um, improved outcomes. They see how it optimizes patient safety. And so nobody was willing to let that go. So that momentum kept moving, even though COVID kind of put a hitch in the training piece of it, we've now moved on to get everybody trained. Um, and we, the other piece of it, I think that was a small challenge was making sure it stayed on our unit. Like we cultivated this, we helped it grow and we want to keep it moving forward. Right. So that was a little bit of a challenge, but I think that we've shown the value of us teaching our own. Um, and so, um, they've let us take the, the reins on that. That's amazing to, to say, no, I'm going to stand up for what my team needs and what my patients need. And it's worked for us and we don't need to do something different right. because you know, I get an organization has to make changes when you're trying to implement it across an entire hospital. Um, but to, to stand up and say, we're going to keep doing this the way we've done it and it's been successful and we're happy to share our knowledge and share our training, um, but to not lose sight of that value. So great job. And, and the benefit of it was using my team steps tools to convey that message. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I've taught you well. It makes me happy. <laughs> um, I want to expand just a little bit on COVID because that definitely um, played a part in what we were doing, but it also was a great way to highlight the tools. So, you know, here we are, we've been in this, the implementation phase for maybe four or five months since we did our training and then we get our first birth center COVID patient. Mm -hmm. And um, tell me about how that worked to have those tools when that change was happening, sometimes yeah. hours, it felt like. Right. I mean, it did, COVID was obviously uh, an unexpected um, crisis. Um, and we, um, things were changing hourly in those first couple months. And so um, having these tools in, in that period of time was, um, it was detrimental. I mean, we needed to be able to have a way to um, be on the same page, have that shared mental model and move forward. So um, there were, gosh, we would use the briefs, the huddle and the debriefs almost daily, um, probably daily, actually, now that I think back on it, because so many things were changing or we were learning things after every case we were learning something new so we would debrief about it and then um the next patient would come in and then we would have a brief before we went into the room about what what we uh learned from the last case so there was just so much value in having 
those communication tools, um, those team step tools to move forward and give those patients the safest care because we didn't necessarily know at the time what the safest care was, right? We had our tools, we had our OB um, backgrounds, but this was one step forward of, oh, nobody knows anything. So we have to have a way to share that information um, uh, to keep our patients safe. Mm -hmm. And to keep our staff safe. And to keep our staff uh, as, safe. As we changed PPE guidelines and workflows. Oh and yeah. <laughs> Well, and my perspective being in incident command and being out of the unit and trying to help facilitate the big picture was I was hearing the stories from ICU and ER who were equally as inundated, if not a hundred times worse than where we were at o in OB at that time. But to see them struggle more and to not be able to communicate that to their teams succinctly and to learn from each case in a method that then protected the absolute next patient that walked in the door. Um, it was just validating again to know that my division's got it. We're good. I can put yeah. my energy um, you know, into the system and into the hospital knowing that. Oh, sorry, let's try that again. Oh, hold on. Let me try to get to the right screen, you guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Okay. Let's present from uh, this here. Let me switch my screen really quick. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Always something. Okay. So thank you, Stacey, for those great points. Um, there was a little bit more to her video, but um, we'll just go with where we're at right now. Um, Overall, just great to hear from her and to see your perspective. And I hope I saw some stuff in the chat come up about how um, engaging it was to hear from somebody who was actually implementing and doing this work. Um, so what did we do next after we um, did this implementation and worked through that? Um, we took and were ready to repeat our TPQ survey. And we initially had planned to do that in the second quarter of 2020. Well, we all know what happened, that was COVID. And so it was definitely not the right time and not the right setting for us to ask people for that. So we pushed that out for about nine months after our original launch. And um, so it was about July of 2020 when we were able to do that. We did have fewer responses than we had um, from our first survey, but we definitely felt that we had valuable information um, that was being presented to us and that could be able to drive our next steps. And so we went ahead and went right back to the drawing board and said, what are we doing in this 30, 60, 90 day plan? And so remember when, when we showed these screens earlier, I asked you just to really look at the distribution of the colors, um, especially how much was green and how much was red. And so I hope you can see here some big shifts. Um, there is way more green on these screens, way less red. And when you're looking at these numbers of change from the previous survey, it just blew us all away as being part of the change team. Um, and Ross, having implemented this over several areas and across the nation, said these are some of the most impressive numbers he had seen, which really just um, made us feel even more proud of the work that we had been doing. Um, so here we've got five areas with 28% increases or higher. Um, some of these areas have no people disagreeing or one or two people disagreeing with the comments. So just showing that creating that foundation for effective communication with the team steps tools was working. When we looked at situational monitoring, we also had the same improvements in some of our areas. Um, here we see four different areas that have no disagree, um, which is just amazing. And two areas that had a single response that disagreed with it. So again, creating that awareness of what is going on around me and how do I affect my team members and how do they affect me um, was evident. Now we do see some drops and those are some things that we um, expect in a certain sense, because as we look here at mutual support, 
we have a different understanding of what does right look like. We may have thought we were able to be resolving conflicts successfully um, and not making it personal, but when we actually learn how to do that well, um, we weren't doing a good job initially. And so that was identified as, hey, this is something we got to focus on for the next round. Um, but still saw an improvement when we were talking about patient safety and challenging others if you don't feel that you're being heard. Um, so we went right back and said, hey, let's break it down. Let's shrink that change one more time in a 30, 60, 90 day plan. Um, and so we decided we have to get back to the basics. And we had new members that had onboarded, new providers that had come into the system. And so we went ahead and said, we got to teach another basic class of the 100 and 200. And we really fought hard to make sure that that was taught by our change team, as Stacy alluded to, that we needed to do the, the work to say, no, it's more valuable when we teach. Um, and we were able to fight for in-person Lego education, even with COVID. We had sanitation protocols for the blocks and all of that stuff because it drove home um, how you can use these tools, even in a small thing as building a tower with Legos. Um, and we now have an implementation plan for sustaining that, um, whether it needs to be every quarter or if it needs to be uh, twice a year in order to ensure that new hires to our division are getting that same basic training because it's part of the culture. And we want you to start off on the right foot. And then we decided with the changes that we had seen and concerns about mutual support um, that we needed that 300 level class that really talked about CUS and two challenge rule and how do we support conflict management. And so we did a hybrid class for this one. We had some in-person learnings already established for our Family Birth Center team, um, but we needed to include our providers and for them to come over for a 30 minute education session, we knew that wasn't valuable for them. So I was able to teach the 300 levels um, and, and share it via Zoom. Um, and so it just really was able to hardware what we were doing and build on that success. So of course, we always have things we learn from, stuff that yeah, just didn't work out the way that we hoped to. And so one of those was we actually made a true destination postcard. Um, we said where we were going and what we wanted to do, had a whimsical picture on it, you know, to be exciting and fun. And we mailed it to the homes for the inpatient team members of women and children's. And a handful of people thought they were cute. We got some pretty good comments about um, how we may not be using our resources efficiently. And so uh, something we probably wouldn't do again if we went big picture implementation. Um, the picture here of all the tools um, on the training card was excellent to use and staff loved having that quick resource. And on the back side, we had created a bingo game. And so if I participated in a huddle for the day, anybody else that was at that huddle could push, put their initials in there real quickly. And as soon as I had my card filled, I could turn it into my leader and get a coffee card and grab a drink on us at the coffee shop. Um, I think we had maybe five people turn in coffee cards. So I think it was just something that was another step that they were using the tools, they knew they were using them, but we couldn't get them to fill the cards out for prizes. Um, we also wanted to you know, create a space in each unit where we were talking about team steps, where we could highlight a tool um, of the month. We could send out kudos for people that had used the tools successfully. Um, and so we set up one of those in the NICU, in the pediatrics and in family birth. Our challenge was real estate and we didn't have a great location for those to where it was part of our morning brief that we could look at those. It was easy to access and quick to reference. They were all in separate spaces. Um, so I think if when we do this again, I would encourage you to implement it in whatever you're doing for your morning huddle or your shift huddle. Um, create it in a space that you're already existing um, where the teams look at quality data and important updates. And then as Stacey had kind of referenced and we talked a little bit more in our discussion, taking this from women and children's and expanding it out into the entire hospital. Um, we had a plan set up and COVID changed those things. And the um, organization wanted to go in a direction of it being taught by somebody who wasn't part of the team, somebody who wasn't a frontline clinician, um, and that it wasn't always involving the people that you work with on a daily basis. And we had seen so much value in that and knew that was part of those amazing and impressive results that we had that um, we fought really hard to continue those things. And Stacey and the leaders that are there still at Valley are continuing to do that to say, no, we want to have 
um, our staff teach this. So it's just something to consider as you look at that sustaining plan, because culture change is a three to five year event, if not more sometimes, especially with the rapid change that we've all had to endure. So how are you going to keep that going and, and build on your wins? And so wrapping things up here, are some key takeaways that I hope you have from today that utilizing that 30, 60, 90 day plan really will shrink that change and make it manageable. It'll help you to engage your frontline staff and it provides support for that multidisciplinary approach. Because um, even if you're not part of women and children's, there's multidisciplinary members of every single team and you need everyone's buy-in. Um, that utilizing data-driven priorities for training and strategies provides measurable outcomes for your success. Also key components when you're needing to speak to senior leaders or publish, you want those data-driven results. Um, and ensuring that your multidisciplinary change team is there will help build engagement, ensure representation from all of those unique disciplines that are participating um, in this team steps work. So I just want to say thank you, and I'll turn it back over to Jen to see what questions we have. Thanks, Stacey. I appreciate that. That was a really comprehensive overview of, you know, your journey from, you know, teeing things up to training to um, how you implement it and a little bit about sustainability. So I think in terms of questions, I'm going to start on some of the more detailed questions and then zoom out. So, um, you know, while you were talking about the Lego activity or also known as the team training tower. Um, you know, a few folks had chatted us and asked for more details. And so I just wanted to call out that I chatted in the link to the facilitator guide that's posted on the University of Washington's website for the Lego or team training tower activity. And I'll put a plug in that I think it's really wonderful and a great um, phased activity to do throughout um, a team step session that helps enforce, not only enforce, but it helps teach and also enforce some of the core team steps tools in a non-clinical simulated activity. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if you have any other um, either tips or tricks or anything else that you want to call out about that um, low tech simulation because it has become widely known. I think it's going to get yeah. grassroots um, activity that's floated around. But for those that don't know or those that are interested in facilitating it, do you have any um, perspective or any facilitation strategies uh, that you'd like to share? Yeah, it's nice to, like you alluded to, it breaks up the training. So you're not just sitting in a room for 90 minutes listening to the team talk and watching slides and videos. Um, and so you start with some basic um, 100 level tools and then you'll initiate the first tower exercise. And it's a blind exercise. And for a lot of type A personalities, they get stressed out just about that and not knowing what they're supposed to do and the panic and it's timed. And um, I think knowing as a facilitator, some of the ground rules will be key when you review those um, instructions, um, ensuring that you have enough Legos for the participants that you plan on attending. Um, is good and um, having to just sit back and let them fumble through it in the beginning and not facilitate because that is part of the training is did they establish a leader do they have closed loop communication are they utilizing um, a, a facilitator to time it because time is a huge component in the exercise um, so each one builds on that and then they'll learn from it and realize, oh, remember, we didn't do this the last time. And you just see it click in their brains. Oh, yeah, we can do this. Yeah, I can use this. And when you debrief, you teach the debrief after the exercise, then you can say, how would you use this in your real world? Well, I need to make sure if we're having a critical event, I've got a timekeeper or I have a recorder. How many times have we done an RCA? And one of the key things is no one was writing down what was happening with our patient. Um, so it just solidifies all of those things with Legos of all things. Mm -hmm. So yes, kudos to the University of Washington team for uh, the Ground Roots Up awesome event. Yeah, and, and I will say the debrief portion is the most critical part of that activity. Yes, they do an activity, they build a tower, but it's really the facilitated debrief that you can, as a, as a faculty or facilitator, you can reinforce some of those tools or reinforce some of those concepts during that debrief. And again, just another you know plug for it. I really like using this activity because sometimes when you do a clinical simulation, when you're trying to teach team steps tools, um, the participants get so focused on some of the um, clinical care of that simulation and not the team performance. And so by kind of cutting out the clinical piece, um, 
you're really having everyone at a very baseline level in this non-clinical um, mm -hmm. simulation. So um, yeah, we've been using this um, activity in this simulation for a number of years. So it's really helpful to, um, to, to run this. Um, moving on and kind of expanding out just a little bit more, um, how did you determine, or do you recall the decision-making on how to determine the 90 minute or two hour sessions? Like, how did you come to that decision for that length of time? Uh, it was based on the content we were trying to present mm -hmm. um, and Ross's expertise. He has usually implemented this in the past and said, you know, start with that two hour window. It probably won't run that long. And each individual presenters, you know, it depends how much robust discussion you get into it right. too. If you've got a really chatty, engaged team and a mix of people that have used team steps in the past and new people that are willing to share and learn, um, you can get some really great conversations going. Um, I don't know if you could do it much shorter than 90 minutes because mm -hmm. of the amount of content that we chose to share at least mm -hmm. with the videos, because um, that really just adds some fun to the training. Um, and then mm -hmm. being able to do the facilitated Lego exercise, ta team tower training exercises takes some time. Right. And, and yeah, for that 90 to 90 minute to two hour session, you guys were just focusing on what you felt were some of the core team steps tools out of the larger toolbox, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have less time available, you could break it down into smaller sessions. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. The facilitators guide and the team training tower um, activity is really helpful because I believe it's broken down by what tools you can teach and what round of Legos. Um, so again, that's a really good training guide that, you know, feel free to those on this webinar to use, no need to reinvent the wheel, but we also suggest customizing to fit your needs. Mm -hmm. um, so um, also kind of along the lines of training, um, I'm just looking at the question here. Um, as you rolled it out, how did you um, decide to roll it out like compared to doing it in one big bang for everyone or department by department? Can you talk about that decision-making and that process? Uh, so it was a little bit of both. When you looked at Valley as a hospital, we chose to go department by department. Um, and part of it was I had already implemented and been part of a process at another facility. And so had the background of it works best when you train as a team because you're learning to be a better team. Mm -hmm. um, and so we chose to pilot it, to work through all the kinks, to figure out what worked with scheduling and some of that um, you know, project management stuff. Um, and I, I do encourage if it is possible to go team by team, because the building that you get in just your class time um, is insurmountable. And something that Stacy talked about that didn't make it in that video, I'm so sorry, we had that challenge. Um, she talks about training with a provider and learning that I can now have a different relationship on the floor with that provider because we went through this together. We learned the same tools and I can now approach a very seasoned, experienced, respected provider and have an honest conversation and use the tools. And it was never meant to say you're a bad clinician or I'm right, you're wrong, but it was, let's just have a conversation. And it was so impactful and to create those bonds because we taught together as a team and we trained together mm -hmm. as a team. So if you can do that, I would highly, highly encourage to do that. Now I know as you get bigger um, organizations or you're looking at sustaining, you may not have the right um, amount of people to do that training. So it changes a little bit, but if you're going for, let's get this all together, all on the same page, um, unit by unit would be my recommendation. Yeah, and I would say from from my perspective, working with you know dozens and dozens of hospitals over the years, I think that typically is is the route that most take or doing it by service line, because then um, you know if you're talking about the OR, you're talking about PACU, you're talking about you know not just the operating room itself. So thinking about service line as well. Mm -hmm. um, have you moving on? Have you tried or had any experience um, tying in teams team steps into A three workshop or like lean methodology? I wouldn't say specifically, but I have a background in lean too, so I feel like some of my project management stuff was based on lean and um, being able to utilize those skills for breaking things down and creating your data driven points. Um, it would be an interesting discussion on how you could make those two things more succinct. 
Yeah. Right. And I believe we've done a webinar in the past and somewhat of a crosswalk. So if we can dig that up, we can certainly share that to those on this webinar after, after the call. Um, and then kind of moving on into a bit more of the sustainability piece, but can you share more details or specific strategies on what helped you sustain some of the gains you made? Mm -hmm. um, calling out when something went really well at multiple levels. So anytime we had a staff meeting, a charge nurse meeting, a provider meeting, we did a quality report out um, for those first two years, we were having a team step slide. So, mm -hmm. hey, here's a great catch that happened because we did a brief. Um, here we did a debrief on this situation and we identified that close-up communication was excellent, um, that we had great feedback. And so just ensuring that we were using those tools and referencing them at any point that we could so it didn't fall off as a flavor of the month, mm -hmm. that people knew that... Um, what I'm doing is closed loop communication. What I'm doing is a huddle with my team um, to connect it back. And really anytime we were doing simulations, team steps is hundred percent in a simulation. Um, so I think it was great to just call that out. And um, like Stacy said, this is now what we do mm -hmm. and everybody's on board with it. Yeah, and I will say that kind of that agenda item, having team steps on, it is huge because not only can you share some of the wins or the bright spots, you can also keep it as protected time to maybe re-educate on a tool. Maybe you find that, um, you know, debriefs are getting long. So mm -hmm. it's, Hey guys, let's remember what are the, you know, what is our debrief checklist or what are the questions that we decided that will be in our debriefs? Let's revisit this or, um, you know, any tool that maybe needs a little bit of tweaking or reintroduction. Again, you have that, maybe that dedicated time on the agenda to, to address, but yeah, like you said, I think, um, celebrating the wins and, um, highlighting the good catches or, or anything that you can connect team steps into is with the language is, is really helpful, um, and a low lift mm -hmm. to do, to do. Um, we're winding down on time. So Stacey, I'm wondering, can you share the deck or would you like yep. me to just for our final, for our final reminders here? Nope. I can get to that. Um, so while Stacey's pulling that up, I just want to thank, um, you all for joining us today. Um, after we close out this webinar, um, a browser will pop up with the evaluation for today. We really value your feedback. Um, so, uh, please take a moment to fill that out. Um, and again, the continuing education details are, are listed here. So if you are new to us and have never created a Duke OneLink account, Duke is our uh, CE provider, just a little bit of background there. Uh, you'll need to create a one-time account um, and then you'll be good forever. Um, so, but after today's webinar, you're gonna need to text that code to that number there within 24 hours to claim your credit. So just a little bit of housekeeping to close out today. Um, but again, I just really wanna thank Stacy for her wonderful presentation um, and the great work and the progress that she's made with Team Steps. Um, if you have any questions uh, for those that are on this webinar, you can uh, hit us up at the email and the phone number on the next slide. Um, if you have any questions or any uh, need access to resources, we're happy to share. So with that, I'm gonna close out today's webinar. Thank you again for attending and we hope to see you again.